Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Warm welcome to Christine Falter, our ASL interpreter. And guess what? Tomorrow is a big day. Tomorrow is where Seattle Public Schools gets back to what we do best, high quality teaching and learning. We're excited to welcome our students and our educators back to the classroom as we kick off 180 days of excellence. At last week's town hall, we talked about health and safety and how we are preparing to respond to the challenges presented by COVID. We discussed the, our layered mitigation strategies and how we're continuing to adapt to changing conditions. Today, I wanna to tell you a little more about two more building blocks, high quality instruction and a culture of care. Now, when we talk about high quality instruction, we are creating a learning environment where students thrive. And we have a once in a generation opportunity to reimagine how public education is delivered. Last school year, our powerful educators reinvented what it means to provide an education, creating new tools, developing new ways to deliver effective teaching and working more closely with families than ever before. And we wanna build on what we had learned and build on what worked well. Our focus on literacy and third grade reading, college and career readiness is more important than ever. And we will not be distracted from those goals. In fact, with this intentional approach to high quality instruction, we've added a focus on math. We are laser focused on literacy, numeracy, and college and career readiness. When we talk about a culture of care, this is to ensure not just physical health and safety, but also mental, emotional health for our students, staff, and families. No matter how focused we are on instruction, students cannot learn if they don't feel safe and they don't feel welcomed in our classroom. This is what we mean when we talk about a culture of care. This means that classroom environments are designed for student well-being, creating a welcoming environment and a safe place where learning is joyful and students can thrive. Aaron Romanix will talk more about how Seattle Public Schools is building this culture of care. But before I pass it over to my colleagues, let me first acknowledge that we are about to open a school in a time when the globe is experiencing another surge in COVID-19 driven by the Delta variant. I recognize the concerns and in some cases fears that family and staff may have. Please know that we continue to work closely with Seattle King County Public Health and with the Washington State Department of Health we have layers of mitigations in our building and strong pro protocols for limiting the transmission of the virus. But this highly contagious variant of COVID-19 is going to be difficult for us in the weeks ahead, ahead of us. So you can help us support a safe and healthy return to our buildings by continuing to follow the guidance of our public health experts, including wearing masks, getting vaccinated, and limiting non-essential activities in the community. community. We take our responsibilities very seriously and are working hand in hand with public health to ensure the best practices in protection and mitigation are followed. So similar to last week in our town hall, we will work to answer your questions live from the chat right here on Teams and Facebook. We may not be able to get all the questions answered, and if not, we'll work to respond to you as soon as possible. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Kashel Toner, our Executive Director for Curriculum Assessment and Instruction to tell us about high quality instruction. Kashel, please. Thank you, Superintendent Jones. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kashel Toner, Executive Director of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction. Thank you all for joining us today to learn a bit more about what school will look like academically this fall. While, we're, while we are returning to high quality in-person learning, we are going to build on the practices that worked well last year. The last year has been filled with rich digital learning opportunities. We have successfully transitioned to be a one-to-one -one laptop school district. 
Now that we have devices for all of our students, we will continue the use of online learning platforms, which have given us opportunities to communicate more quickly and consistently with families and students around assigned work. That's um, digital learning also allows students to access content wherever they are, whenever they need it. That's why all SPS educators are expected to post their lessons plans to one of our district platforms, Seesaw or Schoology on a weekly basis. This would include learning objectives, required learning um, activities or assignments, links to online resources and assignments along with associated due dates. This will support continued learning for students who may need to quarantine as well. This school year, we will also continue our strategic plan goals in third grade reading and college and career readiness, while also adding a focus on seventh grade math. This past spring and throughout the summer, all of our kindergarten through third grade educators participated in a Science of Reading Institute to lay the foundation for implementing a new state required early literacy screening tool. Implementing an assessment tool to measure students' foundational skill development will help our educators adjust instruction to match student need and in turn improve outcomes for third grade reading success. In addition, we're making a major investment in instructional materials for our kindergarten to fifth, fifth grade math uh, material. A team of school leaders, teachers, and parents are working together to find instructional materials that best, best, best fit the needs of our students. In other words, we have initiated a year-long adoption process to review, field test, select, and implement new K-5 math materials next fall. This new K-5 math material coupled with strong 6th through 8th grade equitable math instruction will increase 7th grade math achievement. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Caleb Perkins. Thank you, Kishel. Hi, my name is Caleb Perkins and I'm the Executive Director of College and Career Readiness. To continue sharing our efforts to support high quality instruction this year, I wanted to highlight some of our work in the areas of grading, standards-based instruction, assessment, and course offering. First, with respect to grading, we once again are taking a close look at our grading guidelines for 21-22 to make sure that we're doing everything we can to promote equity. We develop grading guidance to ensure that we're normalizing excellence and to make sure all students, particularly our African-American boys and teens, have the strategic resources and supports that they need to thrive and is in alignment with our strategic plan. We will return to the pre-pandemic grading scale, which means that for secondary students, the grading scale will be A through E for most courses, and elementary students will continue to receive standards-based progress reports three times per year. At the same time, we will require educators to do the following to promote grading for equity. First, we'll provide bi-weekly check-ins with students and families for students at risk of earning an incomplete, a no credit, or a failing grade. Second, we will allow retakes and assignment revisions to the extent possible. And third, we will not give any grades lower than 50% on any assignment, even for a missed assignment. Next, with respect to standards-based instruction, in addition to common grading practices, we continue to streamline and standardize our practices so that students will have a high quality experience regardless of the school they attend. Standards-based instruction is one of the priorities that SPS school leaders identified as an important area in the pursuit of equity and excellence in our schools. The simple idea of standards-based instruction is that it ensures transparency in all elements of teaching and learning process, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and reporting. At the same time, we will work to ensure and to enhance our approach to standards-based instruction by providing all students, particularly our students of color furthest from educational justice, with an education that includes identity, intellect, critical thinking, and joy, in addition to required skills. We will engage teaching staff and school leaders across the district on this approach to standards-based instruction over the course of the year. In assessment, to build on what Kashel was sharing, we're gonna to continue to work to find new ways to measure our students' growth and learning, uh, and we'll be engaging with students and families to ensure that our measures of success are aligned to what our communities value. More than ever last year, we saw the importance of family partnerships in education, and we're gonna to continue to build on that relationship, particularly in our work around assessment. As always, our strategic plan, Seattle Excellence, is our guide. Finally, with respect to course offerings, 
to live up to our values of our strategic plan, we'll be expanding offerings at the middle school and high school level to include new LGBTQ course offerings, Black Studies uh, course offerings, and Ethnic Studies course offerings. These courses will increase accessibility for programming by providing digital options that will be available across the district uh, and not just in one particular school. We will also continue to support and expand the implementation of Since Time Immemorial and the curric related curriculum, given state requirements and more importantly, our values. With respect to college and career readiness, we are working to provide students, particularly those furthest from educational justice, with the tools they need to access and succeed in college level courses and choosing a career path that supports their brilliance and excellence. In summary, SPS will continue to offer grade level core instruction in all required subject areas to ensure students make progress towards graduating ready for college, career, and community. I'll now pass it over to Student Support Services Supervisor Aaron Romanek to discuss our focus on building a culture of care. Aaron. Thank you, Kayla. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Erin Romanek. I'm the Student Support Services Supervisor. One of our top priorities this school year is to support your students' academic and emotional wellness. It will be crucial for the adults in our system to build a culture of care so students can achieve academic success and feel that their mental health and wellness is also being supported. We are committed to supporting the whole child, including mental health and wellness of students across all grade levels. Transitioning back to full-time in-person learning will require that we address the various needs of students. These needs may include addressing stress, grief and loss, or anxiety, as well as reestablishing relationships and connection with students and families. We have hired additional school social workers to provide mental health supports and services in schools which historically have not had access to a school counselor, a school social worker, or a school-based health center. Part of this also will involve co-creating safe and welcoming routines and procedures. We know that structure, consistency, and predictability promote mental health and wellness. Another part will also involve embedding social emotional learning instruction across the school day. During the annual building leader training this summer, we spent time reviewing best practices in SEL. We also know that partnering with community agencies will be crucial, such as referring and providing access to mentoring opportunities, mental health and crisis support, substance use services, and out of school time activities. We have prioritized social emotional learning during these challenging times and look forward to supporting students in transition back to school, back to routines, back to building relationships with peers and adults. Thanks to grants and other outside funding sources, all schools have been given the opportunity to select pre-K-12 district approved social emotional learning instructional materials that are research based and have been selected for alignment with racial equity and the strategic plan. These materials can be found on the Seattle Public Schools website under social emotional learning skills webpage are and in the process of being purchased and distributed to all schools. In addition to SEL instructional materials, staff are also being given a handful of K-12 SEL lessons specific for return to in-person learning. These lessons developed by teachers and district staff will help launch the new school year and are intended to be used within the first month of school. Social emotional learning skills are important for staff and students alike. It is critical that adults apply SEL skills to ourselves and to our instruction. Trainings are being developed for school staff, which focus on the importance of adult SEL skills, as well as instruction of SEL skills for students. As we return to in-person learning, students will receive the skill instruction and see these strategies embedded across content areas. We are pushing our staff to constantly consider how their work with students is relevant to the lived experiences of young people and builds their identity. We also want to express immense gratitude to our community partners who have been so adaptable and supportive throughout the pandemic. We appreciate their expertise, connections, the services they provide, and the important role they play for our families. Our staff is working hard to make sure that we bring forward best practices we learned during the last year as we return to buildings in the fall, and much of the lessons we learned were from our families. Thank you all for listening. Now we're ready to take uh, some of your questions.
Thank you. And I will ask colleagues questions here that we're getting from the chat, that we're getting from Facebook Live. And the first question to our esteemed panel, what will my child do at home due to symptoms to stay engaged with her classroom? Asynchronous learning? Hi, Superintendent Jones. I can take a try at starting to answer that question and then invite my colleagues to join in as well. Um, so remember, we're a school system that works with preschool through grade 12 students, so that question is a little bit nuanced. Um, our youngest learners uh, will learn in the first few weeks of school how to access those digital portals that I was talking with you about, whereas our middle school through high school students will be familiar with those portals from their work um, over the last year, as are our educators. That's why it's really important what I was sharing with you um, that we are uh, our educators will be posting weekly uh, lesson assignments and um, work for their students to do. It's very important that our educators do that work because educators know best exactly where e each child um, uh, is in their own learning pathway inside of their own classroom instruction. So um, educators will post those lessons. Our youngest learners will learn how to access those things at the beginning of the very, uh, you know, in the next few days, actually, um, because uh, devices will also be distributed in the first week of school. So kids will have access um, pre-K through 12 um, to access those assignments. So thanks for that question. We want to uh, make sure our kids are safe first. So that's our that's our first responsibility. All right, thank you. Here's the next question. Why are we adopting a new math curriculum? Hmm. Superintendent Jones, that's me again, I think. Um, so I spoke about uh, the importance of lessons learned, as did Superintendent Jones from this past year. And we've learned that having, um, first of all, instructional materials that are aligned to state standard uh, makes teaching um, so much easier. And our current instructional material is a little bit outdated. So it's time to refresh in that space just from go. Next, um, we learned this year that having digitized um, instructional material, in other words, uh, instructional material that has a digital component to it, um, that can do simulations, you can interact with classmates, is really 21st century learning. And so it's time for our elementary math instructional material to become more aligned to standard and to um, find something that has a digital component to best prepare our students for 21st century learning. All right, thank you. All right, we're getting some really good questions here. The next question is, why did SPS decide to have the lowest grade be 50%? I'll take that, uh, Dr. Jones. Um, so once again, the, you're referring to the required grading practice to not allow uh, teachers to give below 50% in any particular grade. And the idea is that to not make any particular grading practice excessively punitive. In looking across uh, experts on grading across the, the, the nation, as well as talking to our own educators and our own students and families, it is becoming a more and more common practice to have that uh, floor of grading assignments to be at the 50% level, to avoid an excessively punitive grade that unnecessarily brings students' grades down when in fact they are in fact closer to reaching standard and meeting that level of proficiency. Um, so we still uh, are giving teachers a number of uh, pieces of latitude in terms of making grading decisions, but that's one area that, that it makes sense to have that floor. Thanks for the question. All right, here's a, another question. I think this might be you, Caleb, or maybe Cashel. Uh, will there be state-based assessments like SBA map testing this year? I will start and then uh, Kishel, if you wanted to add on, yes, there will definitely be the smarter balanced assessment, which is the state required state assessment. Um, and we'll have more information about the overall plan coming out very soon in terms of how we're going to approach those areas. Uh, we know there's a lot of interest in making sure that, that those are minimally disruptive to instruction and most helpful to our educators as they learn about what their students are learning. Um, so smarter balanced will be administered in ELA and math as well as the science assessment. And those are the state required assessments that we will be doing uh, among other uh, smaller assessments. So with that, uh, Kishel, anything else on state required state assessments? 
Sure, I would just add that I did talk a little bit about a new assessment to Seattle Public Schools, um, and that is our early literacy screener. Um, and that is a new state requirement that's coming online for the whole state this year, um, which I'm actually really excited about um, because it will give educators um, an opportunity to meet with um, kindergarten through second grade kids for about five to six minutes in the fall and do a quick screener to see um, like a checkup to see how kids are doing with their foundational literacy skills. And that's kind of education talk for letter names, letter sounds, letter combinations, those beginning building blocks that um, help children become fluent readers um, by the end of third grade. All right, stay on point, Kishel, this one's for you or Dr. Perkins. How will laptops be used in the classroom? Sure, I can begin. Um, um, so remember, when we think about our system, we think about preschool through grade 12. So that's going to look different across the grades. Um, at the beginning of the school year, we'll be doing just the basic things like issuing laptops to all, all 53,000 kids uh, over the first week of school. Then we'll also be um, familiarizing students with the different digital portals that they'll be using throughout the year. You could think of that as like when you went to school, maybe your teacher talked to you about, okay, every day, here's the first thing we're gonna do, here's the second thing we're gonna do. Um, this would be familiarizing kids to show them how to turn on their laptop, find their Schoology course, find the right assignments, so that if and when children need to access those things remotely or independently um, from home or in community, they'll be really set up for success in that space. Now for the question about um, embedding digital learning inside of pedagogy, that's also kind of education speak for how we're going to use those laptops in the classroom. Well, those laptops we've learned um, have um, versatility and ability to do things that um, we can build on what we learned last year and bring that right on into the classroom. For example, science simulations are uh, a part of our science instructional material and children can work in small groups collaboratively together using their digital device as lots of folks do at work these days um, in their grown up lives. So that's a small example of how uh, we will build on what we learned last year uh, to embed um, digital components into our um, strong teaching practices in Seattle schools. Okay, here's a, here's a burning question. Why is SPS not offering a hybrid option? The brief answer is because the state is requiring that we come back uh, full, fully in person, um, and we've embraced that that approach, and we're very excited given the things that we've shared previously on how to take the learning from last year, particularly as uh, Kashel was just sharing around the use of technology, but how to make that enhance our in-person learning. So again, the short answer is the state is not allowing that. Um, that approach as on a, on a large scale and as a result we are embracing and we're very excited to welcome back our students uh, live and in person across our, our district. Okay here's a here's a good question. Uh, we I don't think we've answered this one yet. Uh, can you define what excellence means for this school year? Somebody said we're talking about 180 days of excellence. What is that? Well, there's many different answers to that, but I think we've referenced a number of them. I think it's partly um, excellence is access to excellent opportunities, uh, such as new ethnic studies, black studies since time and memorial curriculum, um, LGBTQIA courses, and a number of practices that we're going to be promoting to promote high quality instruction in all of our classrooms. That's that's one piece. It's access to new and better curriculum as we're as we're working on in math and in ELA. Um, there are so many different ways that we're trying to promote excellence, and I know there's there's a concern about students who have come back, um, including my own second grader, with that with needing to still work on some basic skills. But that does not prevent him and all the students in Seattle Public Schools from accessing uh, excellent programming and excellent offerings. That's part of the answer. Um, the other part of the answer is that we have high expectations and we have a, a asset based approach where we believe that there's excellence and genius in all of our students and that's how we're going to approach the working with with all of our students. So I'll open it up to Aaron and Cashel to see if they want to share other perspectives because there's probably many, many more uh, excellent answers to that question. Just from the perspective of mental health and wellness, for me, excellence, not only high expectations, but a high level of support. 
So students, to really for us to be curious as adults when students are with us, young people, is what is their story? To be curious about behaviors that we're seeing, to really ask and get to know and, and really connect and engage with families about what other needs and really supporting kind of that whole child. Because while we have um, definitely our, our instruction, we have all of our plans put together, but I really think we need to really look at the social emotional wellness of our young people. And that is excellence as well that we can do is really focusing in on that. Okay, here's another technical question. Will my child be required to carry their electronic device home and back to school each day? I think that's something that's going to be developed with each uh, uh, school and, and with each uh, set of expectations. Obviously, it depends on the age of the student in terms of what's appropriate. Um, but we know and we believe in our educators and our, our school leaders to develop those systems to ensure that whatever the expectation is, is something that will work with students and families to make sure it, it makes sense and it works. So um, I think if you have specific questions, I think that's, that's one to definitely direct specifically to your school community. OK, I think we're I think we're running to our limited questions here. Uh, let me see if we can find one more. Generally, if my child misses uh, class due to being ill, how do they make up the assignment? How do they get the assignment? So I can start off on that one. So um, I think we've talked about a couple of times. Uh, educators will be teaching students across the grade bands, preschool through grade 12, how to access their digital portals, whether that's Schoology or Seesaw, in the first couple of weeks of school. And then they'll be oriented to be able to do that more independently. Certainly that can happen pretty quickly for our third through 12th grade, but you know, the younger kids need a little bit more support and a little bit more practice, and that's totally fine. Um, then assignments will be posted and activities will be posted um, by your classroom's uh, teacher or teachers, depending on how old your child is. Uh, children will then have an opportunity to complete those assignments, um, but each case will look a little different because this, um, you know, the health concerns for each scenario are a little bit different. So we're going to need to work with each child and each classroom teacher to evaluate, um, you know, what is reasonable, because um, if someone's not feeling well, they might need a little extra time to complete those assignments and um, to complete that work. But the goal is learning. The goal is access to high quality instruction. And so however we can work together in partnership with families um, and educators, that's our that's what we're interested in. And that's what we're going to keep working toward. OK, in closing, uh, I think this is you, Dr. Perkin. Can you explain what virtual options the district is offering, if any? Yes, as uh, probably many on the call know and the meeting that we launched a K-5 virtual option pilot program that's uh, housed at Queen Anne Elementary. And we were excited to welcome more than 300 applicants who are now uh, in the process of being enrolled. We know there's interest beyond that, and we've reached out to those families to share the virtual options that are going on across the state. There are a number of virtual options across the state that have been approved by OSPI, the state superintendent's office, and we'll continue to work with those families to, to help them find the option that they're looking for. Uh, but for at this point, there's no additional enrollment at that K-5 virtual option pilot program, and we look forward to continue to work with families to, to help them find what they're looking for. So. Thank you for all the interest. All right, well, well, thanks everyone. I appreciate it. We, uh, we're we going to wrap up. If we couldn't answer your question today, our staff will work to respond to those and we'll post a, we'll post the responses to those questions very soon. Uh, again, thank you to Christina for uh, your interpretation and thank you to my colleagues for your responses to the question. And most, most importantly, thank you to everyone for tuning in today with us.